pump downs. We're going to talk about pump downs, three things we're going to talk about. The theory of a pump down, the steps involved for doing a pump down, and then we're going to go do one live so you can see the whole gambit. So our refrigeration cycle, our compressor sucks in low pressure vapor, pumps out high pressure vapor, it moves the refrigerant. Then we end up at our metering device, which restricts it from a high pressure to a low pressure. So this side's low pressure coming back. That metering device restricts the flow of refrigerant. We're also going to have our service port right here. And our service port's where we hook up our gauges, but also has this cool little valve. If we use our service wrench and our service tool and we close this valve down, we change the refrigeration cycle. Now the compressor is going to be pushing refrigerant this way, but it's going to back up from this point all the way into the condensing coil. On this side, the compressor is still sucking low pressure, and this pressure here is going to bleed through the metering device, and eventually we'll pull all the refrigerant out of this liquid line, out of the evaporator coil, out of the suction line, and the compressor is going to push it back on this side. This allows us to store the refrigerant over here in the condensing coil. This is called a pump down. Now a little bit more to it than that, let's break down all of the components. We're gonna go in steps. Step number one, can we effectively or should we effectively be able to do a pump down? So several things involved with that. Let's look at our pump down. For one, let's talk about where this valve's gonna be and also our liquid line filter dryer. A lot of manufacturers install this liquid line filter dryer before we have our service valve. In that case, it's not gonna be very good for us to do a pump down because if we do a pump down, all the refrigerant is stored over here. And we know anytime we open the system for any reason, we're supposed to change the liquid line filter dryer. It's a disposable, replaceable part. It's like having your oil changed and not changing the oil filter. So if my liquid line filter dryer is before my service valve, I'm not gonna effectively be able to do a pump down because if I cut this out, I'm gonna lose all the refrigerant out of the system. It's gonna be an EPA violation and a hazard issue. So if it has the liquid line filter dryer before this valve, that's gonna be a no-go. That would be called A. B, is our condensing coil gonna be big enough to handle it? So if we're talking about residential tube and thin coils, typically the size of the tube is long enough and big enough volume to handle all the refrigerant in the system. Most of the time, there's always an exception to a rule, right? So most of the time it will handle all the refrigerant. Now when you get to commercial refrigeration, these condensing coils are a lot smaller. So it may not be big enough to handle all the liquid refrigerant. Typically it's not. So for commercial refrigeration, you have an adapter like this, which is a liquid receiver. So that liquid receiver will allow us to store the liquid refrigerant in this liquid receiver. And also if we have micro channel, this one's important. We talked about this earlier. A micro channel is not designed to be pumped down. And these micro channels, these little bitty bitty tubes inside of here, do not allow us enough volume to store all that liquid refrigerant. So these will cause a problem. It won't have a place for all that refrigerant to go and something's going to break. Now, if you see a micro channel condenser coil, your first thought is it can't be pumped down. But some manufacturers actually install liquid receivers with their micro channel coils, so it allows the liquid receiver to store that refrigerant. This way, my refrigerant will have some place to go. A is our liquid line filter dryer before or after the valve. After the valve, great. Before the valve, not so great. Is our coil type big enough to handle it, or do we have a liquid receiver that will handle it? And C, Let's think about the refrigerant. Is the refrigerant itself in good condition? Did the last guy working on it pull a proper vacuum? Do you know it's pure clean refrigerant? Do you know that there's no non-condensables in there? Do you know that the refrigerant hasn't been mixed? Somebody didn't put any other kind of refrigerant there. If the refrigerant that you know and you're certain is in good shape, we could absolutely do a pump down and save us a lot of time. However, if the refrigerant may have non-condensables or it may be a mixture, or maybe there wasn't a good vacuum pulled, maybe there's some acid, maybe there's moisture in there. In these cases, we don't want to be doing a pump down because that same container refrigerant is going to flow back to the system. So in that step one, I call it 1A, make sure our liquid line filter dryer is after our surface valve and not before it as far as the flow of refrigerant goes. Make sure there's not two. We want to make sure our condensing coil is the right type to be able to be big enough to handle it and or a liquid receiver to handle that refrigerant. And also we want to think about the quality of the refrigerant to make sure the refrigerant's in good condition that we can reuse it. Step number two, I want to make sure I have the compressor running. So I start that compressor up. The compressor's now running. We look at our pressures to make sure that, hey, we have some refrigerant in there. Not that our pressures are telling us anything, but we can see that, hey, the refrigerant is flowing. We do have a refrigeration cycle happening. So I have that compressor running. Very simple step. You can hear it. You can see it on your gauges. Step number three, our service valve. 
we want to make sure that we, while it's running, quickly close our liquid line service valve. We quickly close it. While our refrigeration cycle is running, that's going to close this valve. Now, if you have a liquid receiver, you can close the king valve off or front seat the king valve. That's going to allow all the refrigerant to be building up and being stored in this liquid receiver. So I can close it off at our king valve or at our liquid service valve port. Step number four. Step number four trick is two parts in it. We want to be, first off, pulling that refrigerant in, but we're not going to be able to get all of that refrigerant out of the system. We get the majority of it, but we're not going to get all of it. And the catch is this motor is running inside of this shelf. We saw the cutouts. Remember, we saw the windings in there. Well, electricity does funny things in a vacuum. If you've ever seen the old days, they used to use vacuum tubes to make radios and all kinds of things happen. Well, when you put electricity in a vacuum, it starts arcing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So if our compressor runs into a vacuum, we can arc or damage that compressor. Some commercial refrigeration systems build a compressor with the windings designed to handle it being ran into a vacuum. Your typical residential systems are not designed to do so, especially now scroll compressors. Scroll compressors use a different type of insulation on the windings, and if you put a scroll compressor in a vacuum, there's a high chance that compressor will start to arc and you'll damage or burn out the windings inside, as well as the oil on the scroll side working as well. You want to check with the manufacturer of that compressor to see, can it handle a vacuum? So instead of having to call the manufacturer and say, hey, can your, can your compressor handle a vacuum? I just simply follow the safe path of that is don't pull it in a vacuum. In other words, I pull it down to about 15 PSI or so. Commercial systems, five PSI, depending on application design, a lot more goes into it. There's not just a one set rule, but I typically make sure I don't pull it into vacuum. Number two, so B of that, so A, our pressure. B, I want to be listening to the compressor and see what it sounds like. If my compressor starts making these horrible noises, starts sounding really funny, I want to shut it off. I don't want to damage that compressor. Maybe my compressor is not getting oil anymore to it and it's starting to grind. Maybe there's an issue with the high pressure relief valve. Maybe I got too much pressure in this side. I don't want to damage that compressor. So if I hear funny noises, I'm going to shut that compressor off. Now, if this compressor is in good shape, it will stop the flow of refrigerant. Now, Refrigerant will not be able to go back through the valves of the compressor this way, and it can't go this way because they're valves shut. You will still see your suction pressure rise up because as the refrigeration cycle stops moving, the pressure in here, the line temperature will start to increase, the temperature of the evaporator cool will increase, and the vapor pressure will start to rise back up. So let's say I shut off at 15 PSI. It's okay for it to rise up to say 30 PSI and level off. If it keeps rising up and never stops, could very well mean that our compressor valve here is leaking, or maybe our service valve here is leaking. So we want to make sure that that valve on either side is not leaking. And if you pump it down and it just never pumps down at all, never even gets anywhere close to the ballpark, it's a good idea that we could have some bad valves in that compressor. Or if it's scroll, maybe we have a broken part in there. So there's a little trick to that. Now that we have the unit shut off, we can go to our next step, number five. So I take my service wrench and where my service port is, I then close this valve completely off to hold all the refrigerant and the oil inside that compressor. Once I start moving that compressor and bouncing it around, the refrigerant that's in the oil can start to go back out or start to boil back out and cause that to rise. So if I close this valve off, it seals off all of the oil and the refrigerant that's in the suction side of that compressor. Now, a lot of people argue over that step. I find that's the safest, easiest step. The compressor should hold my refrigerant. Then it gives me time to close this valve. You're going to hear other people say you should do X, Y, or Z. And whatever your boss tells you to do while you're there, that's who you're going to follow because he's the one writing your paycheck. But simplicity, shut the compressor off first, then we can close this valve off. Now that that valve's closed off, our very last step, we can do a recovery on what's left of the system. So we're gonna be recovering the refrigerant out of this side of the refrigeration system. It's not gonna take very long because it's just vapor, but it is important that we do recover that refrigerant out because if the EPA walks up while you're venting that refrigerant, you're looking at a fine, plus is it ozone depletion or is it climate change potential? You wanna make sure that you're following all those safety procedures. So our refrigerant's trapped in here, we can do the work. Now the benefit of doing a pump down is when I get ready to do that recovery, it's fast. I'm only recovering that little bit of vapor out of here. Then when I get through solving my leak or whatever problem I have, I'm pulling a vacuum. I only have to pull a vacuum in just this one little section right here. It's very fast. It's a lot faster than having to pull a vacuum through all the oil of the compressor and all of the condenser. Then I get ready to start the system back up. I want to open the suction valve first. I want to allow any of the oil in here to go this way first, 
then I'm going to open up the high side and that's going to allow the high pressure refrigerant to push the oil back into that compressor. So those are the steps. Now let's go do it live. So step one, my condensing coil is large enough, tube and fence. It can handle the refrigerant I'm going to pump down. My liquid line filter dryer is after my service port, my service valve. It is located outside, but notice the paint's in very good shape. It's not burnt, so it's not an issue. And I know that my refrigerant in this case is in good shape. Step number two, have the system running. I can hear the compressor running. Step number three, quickly close the liquid line valve. Step number four, watch my suction pressure. I'm at 22, but I got funny noises. Funny noises, I'm gonna shut it off. Don't know what the noise is, made unusual noises. So now I'm at 40 PSI. It rose a little bit and it pretty well stopped at 41 PSI. So now my valves are good. I wanna close off the suction side. And my refrigerant, most of my refrigerant is now pumped down into the outdoor condensing unit. Now what I can do is get my recovery equipment out. I can recover the last little bit of vapor. So our service port's gonna be reading this on this side. I can recover that last little bit of vapor. Then I can do whatever work I need to. Pressure test, change my filter dryer, pull a vacuum just on this side, and then recharge it. Same amount of pressure on both sides, pretty well equalized. Now I didn't do any work on this one, so I'm just gonna open it up. So if we did all the other work, what we wanna do is reverse it. We wanna open the suction side first. This way, any of the oil that's a pressure difference, the oil is gonna come out of the compressor this direction. And then when I open the liquid side, you're gonna hear the refrigerant coming out. This pushes the refrigerant through the indoor unit evaporator and it pushes it right back this direction so everything is where it should be. Thing left out was these caps. You wanna have these caps off and ready at step one. Uh, and if any time you're doing a vacuum or pressure test, you wanna make sure these caps are on because these caps are known to leak. Inside of here, they leak out. So once we get them tightened up, just a little extra little turn like that, don't get too carried away. I've worked with some really strong guys before and they over tighten that cap and they've actually, it's just brass, it just busts the top right out of this cap. In between any of the steps, doing vacuum, recovery, recharge, make sure you have that cap on. Now we're ready to start it back up.